Good afternoon. I'm very happy to have you all here today in Warren County, in New Jersey. I want you to know that I deeply appreciate your taking your valuable time to come out here today and hear my simple words. Many of you know of me and my work. Some of you may not. For the benefit of those who are not intimately familiar with my work, I'll give you a, a brief chronology of the history of from whence I have come. My name is Riley Lee Martin. I was born in the Mississippi Delta on the 9th of May in 1946 to a very poor sharecropper family. The fall of that year, the waters came in torrential downpours. The levees broke and flooded the cotton land. My family was forced to move across the river into northeastern Arkansas. It was there in 1953 at the age of seven that I saw lights above the river late in the evening, late in the night, perhaps two o'clock in the morning. On the first two nights, I tried to awaken two of my brothers who slept in the same big room with me, and I could not. I would see the lights come over. There were four of them one larger, three smaller. They would do aerobatics in the sky and uh, revolve around the larger one. Presently, the larger one would drop down towards the riverbank. The light was so bright until it shone in my room and illuminated the entire room. On the third night, it landed close down on the river. Well, I had what they call trot lines. Uh, these are lines that you put out in the evening and check them in the morning for fish, put them back out and check them at nightfall. And in my mind's eye, I thought someone was robbing my trot line. And they had a big, big light. And uh, I decided to go out that night because uh, within myself, I thought I heard them calling, uh, friend Martin, come out. So I went out and I took my trusty dog, Brown Boy, and we went down to the river bottom. When I came through a cane break, I saw the ship. It was about uh, the classical saucer-shaped ship. It was about 33 feet across, about 18 feet deep. It looked all in burnished silver, but it emanated various different color lights. I learned later that the hues of the lights depends upon uh, the atmospheric composture of the air. For instance, they are burning hydrogen-fed fusion cores uh, at some 200 million degrees, which punches up the anti-grav mechanisms of the ship and keeps it balanced. You understand, by changing the shifts in the gravitational forces of that, those magnets, uh, they are able to move back and forth, up and down, things of this nature. Now, this ship was moored it didn't have standing legs like you would expect a crab to have. It was moored by three flexible legs and it danced about like a cork on water. Presently, I saw the dome clear, though it looked metallurgic. I saw it clear like glass and I saw two beings standing there looking down at me. It occurred to me then that probably I should get the hell out of there. <laughs> and uh, so even as I thought the thought, I was struck with a blue-white light, and I could not move. Now, my dog, Brown Boy, was a very noble dog. He would fight anything. He fought raccoons, foxes, wolves, even bears or wild hogs. He was uh, fearless, but he thought it better that he should go and get some help, and the bastard left me. Presently, <coughs> a chute came down from the bottom of the ship, and two beings came out, one a little shorter than the other. They were dressed in illuminated jumpsuits like. Uh, and on their left breast was a seven-pointed star uh, with an H in the middle, uh, uh, a green H in the middle. And they walked toward me. They had these bubble-type helmets. 
uh, because I am told that the atmosphere upon this planet is so detrimental until it would be dangerous for them to breathe it. Uh, it is in fact dangerous for humans to breathe. Nonetheless, they got me by each arm and they started to walk me back toward the ship. And they said, friend Martin, we have come again. Don't you remember us? I said, I can't remember you. Who are you? They said, friend Martin, don't you remember us from the Tigris and Euphrates and the Nile River Valley when your ancestors did raise the Pyram and the Valley of Giza? Don't you remember us? I said, slowly coming back. You know? <laughs> and uh, they say, come and go with us. I said, well, you'll have to ask my mama now because she's going to worry about me. He said, don't worry, we'll soon bring you home again. I entered the chute. We raised up the chute. There was a door that opened. They went out and uh, told me to stay. Presently, all about me, it seemed like a million little tiny lights dancing over me. Uh, I could feel the pulsations uh, all over my body. I looked down and my clothing had deteriorated and I was completely nude. Uh, biomolecular dispersion or something of this nature. And uh, this was the decontamination process I was later to learn. Then there was a mist pss, that came in and uh, momentarily it kind of hurt the nose but then it became pleasant and I became pleasant and the door opened and I came in there was a recliner larger than their own that they set me in first they put me on uh, a kind of a table there were two taller beings that came up about me and began to scan my body with lights and to touch feel it. There were little like little suction cups or something on their fingers and uh, they scared me because they were not nice to look at. I later learned that they are called stagians while the shorter ones are beobians. Now the stagians I learned are the most docile, uh, humblest, uh, less warlike species in the whole galaxy but they have the ability, the neurological ability to uh, capture absorb and disseminate trillions of bits of information very swiftly and they are the scientists and the ones who generally do the uh, examinations on human beings. I heard the short male and the female talking to one another. They had taken off their helmets yeah. and uh, they were using language that I could not yeah. understand. Uh, um, Yahweh, one. And I said, you better let me go because my daddy got a shotgun and he's going to get you. And then they turned and looked at me and they understood that I could hear them clearly and they began to talk with me. Then Martin, don't worry. Uh, we'll not harm you. We will soon bring you home again. It is time that the world should be, should know of the data that we hold for them. And we were booking. Presently, they let me up and put me in the recliner type seat and they said, look back. I looked back and I saw the earth going away. I saw the peninsula of Florida and up the east coast. I saw darkness moving across the land and the light chasing it. Then I heard something say, Ooh. I said, what was that? He said, fear not, for that was your lunar. We were passing the moon, and it hadn't taken but a few moments. <laughs> then he said, look before you, but close your eyes. There'll be a light. <laughs> Presently, in the midst of this hyperspace transition, everything became translucent. He was translucent. Uh, I was translucent. There were uh, purple gumdrops moving slowly uh, through my body and things of this nature and then there were certain uh, waves <laughs> I learned that the, we were moving across the waves of light traveling far far faster than the speed of light light uh, contrary to popular belief 
or does not travel on a lineal path like this. Light oscillates through the galaxy. Now, if you get caught in the light stream about six trillion miles uh, an hour, you're moving slow because you've got to follow the loops. However, when you break light speed, and there are seven steps uh, to this breaking of light speed and going into hyperspace, once you break it, you're going across the loops. Boom, you see. Uh, 1953, boom, uh, uh, 1900, boom, 2000 BC, etc., etc. Uh, you're going across the loops and then you're squeezing, essentially what you're doing is squeezing time. And then there was another flare, boom, and uh, we were barrel rolling out and I looked out uh, when the ship settled to my left and I saw this great humongous planet uh, and the great ice ring we had kicked out near the planet Saturn. And off in the distance, I saw a glimmering star between one of the great moons and Saturn proper. And I said, that is so beautiful. What is it? He said, that is our mothership, friend Martin. And we were moving a tor uh, towards it, I thought, maybe at 10,000 uh, kilometers an hour or what have you. Uh, and I said, you better slow down, we're gonna hit this thing, you know? <laughs> Uh, because it was getting so big and so big. But as we got to it, we were imbibed into the ship like the shutter of a camera. It wasn't like a slow landing bay. And we came to a dead stop, 10,000 miles an hour, to a dead stop in a tenth of a second. And I must admit that for a moment, it kind of uh, uh, causes you uh, a little uh, uh, disorientation, uh, so to speak but they can do this. The mothership is 40 kilometers across at about 70 up and down. It is peopled by seven intelligent species of extraterrestrials. These are the Biabis, whom I know best, who hung out with me, who taught me. The Biabi, the typical Biabian male, is about four feet in height cranial structures large in proportion with the body, large oval eyes, small nose close to the profile, <coughs> thin lips, baby teeth, no discernible ear flaps. The upper torso is well formed but the arms are somewhat elongated, the fingertips stretching almost to the knees. Uh, the lower part of the body well formed but the legs are kind of spindly and the feet are flat. Biavians have four fingers, that is a thumb, and these three fingers, the forefinger being more prominent, a little more prominent uh, than the rest. B. Avians are weigh about 35 kilos or about 80 pounds. Uh, they come in complexions from olive black to chalk white and all of the browns and reds and yellows in between. Their numbers are tens of thousands. I understand that the mothership has stood at that location for the recorded history of mankind as we know it from the primordial time that we first started building homogeneous cities and things of this nature uh, in ancient Sumeria when those uh, people they speak of in the Bible as angels came down and made it with the daughters of men and their sons became of old great men of renown. If you read uh, the book of Genesis you'll find that uh, in the house of Adam which is one of the first uh, bibliographies or chronologies of uh, the lifespans of those people. You'll find that uh, some lived six, seven, eight, nine hundred, who was it, Methuselah? 969 years. Mm -hmm. Now they knew what years were and what have you, so a year was a year. You understand. Uh, as time went by and the people spread out upon the land and started mixing with the other Semitic, Africanus, uh, Asia, European factions and things of this nature, the lifespan diminished and became uh, lesser as time went by. But I tell you truly that there is not one of you who sit before me today who probably doesn't have some of the uh, genetic traits of these ancient uh, angels or you may call them Atlanteans. Others of you may uh, recognize them as Anunnaki or something of this nature.